Hey, good afternoon and welcome to the Riverwood Conservancy's latest Facebook Live presentation. Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Rashid Clark. I'm the marketing specialist for the Riverwood Conservancy and I'm joined by Dave Taylor, a wildlife photographer, author of more than 40 books on wildlife and ecology, all around wildlife expert uh, for another wonderful presentation. I'm sure uh, in store for today. Uh, today we'll be talking about Riverwood's little creatures. So while well, a lot of people will come to Riverwood looking for deer, uh, maybe some larger animals, some larger birds, uh, there's lots of little creatures uh, roaming around the park that uh, deserve a lot of attention. They're not only cute, uh, they're very important to our ecosystem and uh, Dave's going to talk a lot about that today. If you have any questions for us throughout the presentation, please drop them into the comments section. We'll get to as many questions and comments uh, from you as we can throughout the day today. And just before we get started, a reminder that that uh, we are dealing with the effects of COVID-19 and having to cancel a lot of our events, in fact, all of our events, including our large fundraisers. So if you have the financial ability, we would very much appreciate a donation to keep programs like this going. You can give at theriverwoodconservancy.org. And that's all for the donation asks for now. Uh, Dave, I will turn things over to you. Okay, thank you. And welcome again to one of our talks. Um, we're doing a series of talks on the natural history, and I thought we'd end up with some of the smaller creatures, mammals particularly, <clears throat> that are found at Riverwood. So if we can go to the slides, I will start her off. So I'm calling this little folk. Uh, basically what I'm referring to are the small mammals that you find in Riverwood and Mississauga. And the first one we're gonna take a look at is, if I, there we go, there we go the northern short-tailed shrew. This is a very small animal. It's far more common than you might think. Um, it's mostly uh, unseen because it likes to live under the leaf litter or under the soil. It eats a lot of protein. These little mammals, to explain something in simple terms, because they're so small, they have to eat a lot of food. So if you were to take your thumb that would be a little bit smaller than this shrew, but not much. And if you wrap tape around it and take the tape off, that would give you the, an idea of the amount of skin that you have exposed. And then if you did the same thing and you wrapped it around your full hand, it would look like there's a lot more skin exposed. But in reality, there's a lot more flesh in your hand than there is in your thumb, which is one of the reasons why when you're outside on a cold winter day, your fingers get chilled. Well, this little guy has that problem. He doesn't have a lot of weight there. So when he's out in the woods, especially on a cold winter day, he's going to lose body heat quite rapidly. So he has to eat a lot. Now, even saying that, this guy is pretty good. He spends about 16% of his day actually eating food. And the rest of the time, he's resting. And when he rests, his body temperature is allowed to drop. So he is getting a lot of food because he'll eat worms, he'll eat seeds, he'll eat um, maybe mice, he'll eat whatever he can get. And he is toxic. His bite is poisonous. Uh, now, if you see one, you don't have to worry that this is some sort of mammal version of a rattlesnake. It's not. But if you were to be bitten by this, just besides being bitten, you would find it uncomfortable. The toxins in his bite act on the nervous system of the smaller animals that he eats and basically stops them from able to run away. <clears throat> and he's able to dine on them at his leisure. <clears throat> kind of a neat animal. They are also, we think, at least one of the professors, Monica of Elk at the UTM, has suggested that these guys might be very, very important in pollinating certain spring wildflowers like trilliums. And I think she was going to do a study on it. I don't know where that stands, but it was something that we discussed at Riverwood one day and always intrigued me. The newest arrival to Riverwood and to Mississauga is the Virginia possum. Possums crossed over on the land bridge from South America. There were two species of possum, I believe, uh, surviving after the asteroid wiped out the dinosaurs. So there was a huge number of animals wiped out. And the, there were a couple of species of possum that survived. 
And then they died out, and, but the opossum family survived very nicely in South America where there are several species. Well, about three million years ago, when these islands started to form due to volcanic reactions and eruptions in the Caribbean, and, and they formed the land bridge that we now know as Costa Rica and uh, those other countries, Central America, they crossed over either from the islands or on the land, and they've been invading North America since. Uh, an interesting aspect of these guys is these are marsupials. There are only marsupial. They've been in Canada probably for the last 50, 60 years, probably in Mississauga in the last 30 years. They are very susceptible to frost. And often uh, if, after the first winter, they will have lost the tip of their tail and the tip of their nose to frostbite. They're prolific breeders. They will have, in the year and a half, two years that they live, they could have up to 26 babies. Uh, most of the babies, of course, won't survive. And yes, they do play dead. Um, if they're confronted with a large dog or a, a scary person, they roll over and will play dead. Although I will tell you that they have very, very sharp teeth and uh, you really don't want to mess with them. There are three or four species of bats found in Mississauga and in Riverwood. The most common, the one that you are most likely to see is the little brown bat. If you have lights on in your backyard at night and you've got insects fluttering around, you will see these bats going by. Uh, there's the big brown bat, there's the hoary bat, and the eastern pipstrel that also are found here. But this is the one that you see because it's active mostly, uh, well, it starts act, being active just as the sun is going down and is active most of the night. Um, we've done studies at Riverwood on these things. We know they're there. Oddly, from what I am told, and I haven't checked personally, most of the bats, all of the bats at Riverwood or in, in Mississauga are males. The female bats tend to live on the caves on the escarpment where they have their young. And then when they migrate south, the males join them and the males will meet with anything, apparently. They are, uh, doesn't matter if it's male or female, awake or asleep. They have a very um, eclectic desire to mate. The problem with these bats, or for these bats, twofold. Insects are declining across North America for all sorts of reasons. And you can see that even if you go back in your memory and if you were driving 30 years ago, you would have all these insect hits on your windshield, especially if you're going up north. It's much, much rarer now. And that's because the number of insects have declined. Uh, bats feed on insects. So we're losing these bats for that reason. They're also getting this fungus in their nostrils. And because these are communal bats and they nest in huge colonies, once the fungus gets into a colony, it can reduce the number of survivors. In fact, the bat population, little brown bats, has been reduced to nine, by 90%. This is the Eastern Pipstrel. It's a very small bat, about half the size of the little brown bat. Very rare sighting in and around Riverwood. Um, it's there, it's one of our smaller bats. Uh, just on another topic related to bats, you know, women used to be afraid that bats would land in their hair. And we would tell the, especially when I was a teacher, tell the kids, well, that's not going to happen. But on safari in Africa, I've had bats hit me in the head twice when they're flying out at night. So they're not perfect with their um, radar. One of the more common mammals of Riverwood and Mississauga is the metal vole. Now, it looks like a mouse. It's a prolific breeder. It will breed uh, every month except probably February. And because it stops breeding in February, its main predators tend to be more active because they can't find the food they would normally find. For example, coyotes. The best time to see a coyote in Mississauga or a red fox is in February, especially in a cold February, because these little guys have stopped breeding there aren't a lot of these ma small mammals to feed on. 
so the coyotes have to be active longer. They live under the snow. And if you and I were to try and live under the snow, we would die because of the carbon monoxide buildup from our own breath. These guys are able to tolerate it. But every now and again, they have to come out, drill a hole up through the snow and get fresh air. And then they go back down and you can see the tracks. If you're a hawk, you're waiting for these guys to come up and then you scoop down and grab them. Owls can hear them moving through the snow as can coyotes. The worst hunting conditions for owls and coyotes then for these guys is when you get a layer of ice on top of the snow. They can't break through it as easily. So the metal bowl is adapted to be able to breathe uh, this type of uh, oxygen underneath the snow. Now, they do look like mice, except they're missing Mickey's signature big ears. They do not have big ears. They're very small ears. So it's easy to tell them apart. They can live by the hundreds in an acre. In fact, in one acre, there could be over 1,500 kilometers of metal trails. And where these metal trails meet, the animals leave their droppings. And that's a way of saying to them, this is my territory. So metal bowls will come along and they'll use these communal washrooms and they sort of know who's around, what's going on, whether they're in heat, whether they're not in heat. And you can see these trails after the snow melts, either sometimes on your own lawn, but in Riverwood, if you look at the grassy areas, particularly as you drive in, there's long grass there and that's a good spot to look for these critters. This is one you probably don't want to be familiar with, the house mouse. It's um, a mouse that has adapted to living in our world. And when it lives in our houses and in our buildings, they tend to do really well feeding on our food and they tend to have more of them. This is the animal whose droppings can carry some serious diseases. You do not want this animal in your house. Um, there are all sorts of ways of getting rid of it. Um, but it's not a natural animal to have around the place. There is another rodent that we'll come to that is probably worse. You occasionally see them outside. You notice the big ears. And on this one, you can see the tail trailing off to the right of the picture. Much longer tail. This mouse is fascinating. We have a trail called the Mouse Trail at Riverwood. And it was named for this guy. This is the white-footed mouse. And again, Professor at UTM, Dr. Monica Velka, was doing research on these animals and putting glow sticks on them to watch where they go at night because these mice are arboreal. They live in the treetops. And I went out one night with her and we let some of these mice go. You could see at the top of the trees, these little lights, glow sticks running through. It was quite amazing. These are a favorite prey of the owl. Uh, foxes, raccoons, they're very prolific breeders. And we had set up on the mouse trail breeding boxes to facilitate the capture of these animals so we could mark them. It was quite a study. Unfortunately, uh, it didn't last. They look very much like the house mouse, um, but uh, they are really more found in the outdoors. They're not something you're likely to find in your house. Cute little guys. This guy probably gives you the heebie-jeebies. This is the brown or black rat. This is the only picture I've ever taken of one at Riverwood. It came out of our garbage by the chapel house and scooted away. I've seen them down on the lake shore along near where restaurants were. Um, they are very common. And you might well be thinking, well, I don't have them around my place because I don't have a restaurant and I keep my place neat. <sighs> they say in Canada, you're never more than 100 meters away from a brown rat. That's how common they are. These are the rats that brought in the plague. These are the rats that came over by the ships from India and Asia. They were responsible for the death of millions and millions of people back in the days of the Black Plague in Europe. Um, they carried ticks, they carried a bite, um, all sorts of horror stories about these things. If you feed birds 
and you have a lot of food on the ground, you're almost certainly going to have these guys around. They are very common. It's not an animal. It's native to North America. One could say they are truly an invasive species. Now we get to some of the cuter guys. Although I'm sure if they get in your house, they're not that cute. The Eastern Chipmunk. The Eastern Chipmunk is just, you know, a delight. You, people like to see these guys. We have lots of them at Riverwood. They are the prey of a lot of our predators, like the owls and like the fox and the coyote. Um, they're very solitary. They build dens under the ground. They go into a toper during the winter. They can climb trees. In fact, their name is adapted from an indigenous name, which meant literally comes down the tree heads first. Uh, you don't see them in trees very often. In fact, I know pe some people believe they can't climb trees, but they're a type of squirrel, they're a ground squirrel, and they are very good at climbing. Um, they stuff their cheeks with food to carry the fruit. Other squirrels don't do that. This is a chipmunk thing. This guy has just got a few things in his mouth. There are several types of chipmunks. A lot of people think there's the chipmunk. Well, the eastern chipmunk is really found in eastern Canada and parts of the states. It goes out as far as Manitoba, but if you go a little further afield, you have the Colorado chipmunk, the least chipmunk, uh, the Cliff chipmunk, Townsend chipmunk, the Alpine chipmunk, and there's a few others that don't go on this list. They all look the same because they have stripes. Some of them are even smaller than our chipmunk. All of them are adorable. So is this guy. The red squirrel is becoming more and more common around Riverwood. It used to be when I started at Riverwood back in 2003 and when I walked it back in the 80s, you would occasionally see these guys. They have moved down from the north. And I now see them on a regular basis in my backyard. Um, they, they're spreading, their range is spreading. We never saw red squirrels 30 years ago, 20 years ago. I, in fact, I've seen one chipmunk uh, in my backyard. And I live a mile from Riverwood. But the red squirrel is becoming more and more common. And not only am I seeing it in my backyard now, I am seeing it in other people's backyards. It's crossing the roads. It's spreading further and further afield. And one of the things during my walks, while well, we've been housebound by COVID, is encountering these red squirrels further and further away. I, Riverwood kind of acted like the Credit River Valley, really acted like a reservoir for these guys in the pine trees. But, but they have been able to spread out and are doing quite well. They do like pine trees and they take the pine nuts and they will cache them. Unlike other squirrels, these guys will cache their food and they'll have piles of them at the base of a tree. And that cache is a very important food source for black bears and grizzly bears. We don't have either species in Riverwood or in Mississauga, as far as I know about black bears. But out west, grizzlies just love to raid a red squirrel nest. The other squirrel that you see quite common is the black or the gray squirrel. The color varies by location. Around us, it's about a 50-50 mix between black and gray squirrels with a little bit of reddish tinge to them. Uh, as you go further, further north, black color predominates. If you go south into Myrtle Beach area, they're all gray. You won't see any black squirrels. The black coloration is believed to be an adaptation to living in the north woods. And the gray is better suited for the south probably having to do with heat retention. Because Southern Ontario is where it is, both colors are found quite commonly. It used to be in the old days that the forest stretched literally unbroken from Canada's east shore to Canada's west shore and across the states. And that was a highway for squirrels. And, and as we've cut down the forest, 
like I think it was, I think I said in another talk, 70% of Ontario's forests were, Southern Ontario's forests were cut down. These squirrels lost a lot of habitat and their numbers declined. Well, they're doing okay at Riverwood. They're certainly eating a lot of our food and they certainly can outsmart me. A neat thing about these guys, and I did it when I taught, I had my students compare their intelligence to the squirrels. And invariably, the squirrels won on one test. I've got to point that out. We would take toothpicks and we would hide the toothpicks all around the place. And then I would equate that with the squirrel hiding nuts and acorns. Squirrels can find over 90%. My kids probably could find 70%. But my kids cheated. They stole other people's toothpicks so that their numbers looked higher. Well, the squirrels got them beat there. These squirrels will cheat and steal other squirrels' nuts and acorns. But the really cool thing is these squirrels are so smart that they'll fake hide a nut so that the squirrel that's watching them uh, thinks, ah, I know where that nut is, and he'll come over to dig it up. Meanwhile, the squirrel with the nut has gone away and is hidden in someplace else. They do eat baby birds, and a lot of people find that kind of startling and a little bit gross when they see one of these guys wandering by with uh, a baby bird in its mouth. The groundhog is our largest member of the squirrel family. It's a type of marmot, one of four species of marmot found in North America. And they're found globally around the world in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, it is a true hibernator. The chipmunk goes to sleep in the winter, but it's not a true hibernator. The groundhog is a true hibernator. And of course, it's famous for coming out on Groundhog Day and telling us if we're going to have more winter. What is really happening is these true hibernators still have to eat and go to the bathroom. So they'll go to sleep for three or four weeks in a deep sleep, rolled up in a ball, and they're so far out of it that you can literally pick them up and roll them along the road. And now, not that I've ever done that, but somebody has, I guess. And they'll stay asleep. But sometime in the month, they start to shiver, you get really cold, and their heart rate starts to rise. They stretch, and they do what most of us tend to do, us older folks, anyhow walk up, they go to the washroom, they get a night, midnight snack, and then they go back to sleep. But around March, sometimes these guys wake up, and the males, if it's a nice day, milder day, they will come out, and they're not looking for their shadow, they're looking for a girlfriend, because this is the beginning of their breeding season. We used to have groundhogs at Riverwood. Uh, Derek Stone, I think, saw one last year, they were very common out where the chapel uh, gardens are. But when we put the gardens in, these guys disappeared. And generally, I'm finding it harder to find groundhogs than ever because I think the number of coyotes has just gone up. And these guys are great food for them. They're also great food for them are the cottontail rabbits. This has been a bumper year for cottontail rabbits. They're everywhere. These guys will breed a couple of times a year. Um, and then the young hop, hop off, we are seeing the second breeding uh, at Riverwood. Now you'll see babies around and you would have seen babies a couple of months ago. They are a prime um, animal for our predators, hawks, owls, minks, foxes, coyotes. Everybody likes to have a cottontail dinner. Cottontail, as I've said before, were here prior to the Little Ice Age. So a thousand years ago, they were here, died out from Ontario and then moved back in in the late 1800s. Muskrat were prized for their fur and they were pretty much trapped out of Ontario. Uh, they make little pop-ups in marshes. Our muskrat at Riverwood actually den up in the banks and you can see them. There was a time when uh, muskrats were seen not only in the Credit River, but in our marsh. This was taken in the marsh, the pond 
that is now covered with Phragmites. And hopefully when we get the Phragmites cleared out of there, the muskrats will make a return. They need open water. They are a favorite prey of the mink. I have been having so much fun photographing American beavers during this time of COVID. I've taken beaver pictures for years, um, but this year, just for some reason, there seemed to be a lot of beaver around uh, Mississauga and a lot of very active lodges and dens. I was out last night watching some. Uh, Catherine Wassendorf, our uh, secondary teacher, told me about another place where she was seeing them. Uh, they are very common. They estimate probably in the Toronto area there are three to 400 beaver living in the bounds. Now, what's remarkable about that is beaver were not permitted south of the Highway 400 corridor. That was back in the 50s. Beavers apparently are not very law-abiding and come across. And a lot of people don't like beavers on their property because they do cut a lot of trees down. Certainly the city has removed beavers. Uh, people in cottage country will also remove them. People who have roads across streams and the beaver dams up the stream and floods the roads remove them. But when a beaver moves in, it is really important for the ecosystem because all that water it's keeping there keeps the habitat really, really rich. And they were pretty much trapped out. Canada wouldn't exist really without beaver trapping in the 16, 17, 1800s was such an important industry. But as we got rid of the beavers, we actually created, created an opportunity for deserts to spread. And where they have restored beavers into deserts, they have noticed that the deserts have greened up. Really a neat story. They've recently restored beavers to Scotland. These are Canadian beavers. Uh, there is a European beaver that is strictly a bank dweller. Beaver is known for slapping its tail in the water when it's worn and then diving, which is always cool if you're on a canoe trip to see that. It's making a comeback. Now, if you look around Mississauga and you're looking for beavers, you're looking for a lodge. Some beavers den in banks. The beavers that we've had in Riverwood had a combination of a lodge and a built onto the side of a bank and then went in the bank. Right now, as far as I know, there are no active beavers in Riverwood. There may be one or two that swim in. Uh, recent flooding has gotten rid of them. They need a bit deeper water than we have. And we, you know, every couple of years we see beavers here and often we'll see them with our students, but they're not as common as they once were in Riverwood, but certainly in Mississauga they are. <clears throat> Striped skunk, people always say you can smell a skunk, not true. You can't smell a skunk unless the skunk wants to be smelled. And when he releases, he'll stand on his front feet and fire it at you. Close range, it can blind you. You don't want to have that happen. But we have skunks around here, and we don't even smell them ever. I was camping once, and we had some with my students. And one of the kids brought some eggs, and they left them outside the tent. And we woke up. Now, this was a small, flimsy tent. Woke up and looked out, and there's a skunk eating the eggs. Nobody could smell them. If you do smell a skunk, it probably is not a skunk you're smelling, but a red fox. Because red fox like to advertise their presence. They don't use it as a, a warning device or defensive advice device. So if you smell a skunk, it's probably a red fox. They do get washed out from their dens in the winter. This one is looking rather bedraggled. Skunks used to be classified as weasels. They're now classified in their own category. The mink, however, is a true weasel. A lot of mink along the lake shore, along the rivers. You can encounter mink just about anywhere uh, if it's near water. Uh, they, are, they feed on small critters. They like mice. They like muskrats. But they also like ducks. And I've seen one actually attack a swan. The swan just shook it off. These are not very big weasels. This was taken at Riverwood a few years ago. Again, once our pond is restored, it would be a place to look for mink. These are very active animals. They hunt all day long, unlike the uh, 
short tail is true that we began with, these guys are more active during the day because they have to constantly eat. We also have the long-tailed weasel. It sometimes will turn white in the winter, it doesn't always. They're very common as well, but they're seen less than the mink. Um, they are around, they are very fast, they're eating all of the time. And I can't say I have seen them very often in Riverwood. I've seen them once or twice. Rita Schultze, who was our first teacher, encountered them. And one time I had a photography class and we walked up the top of the uh, steepest hill and I turned left and one of my students stopped and took a picture of a weasel looking out of a hole in a tree. They're good climbers. These guys you probably have in your backyard. The most common, most numerous population of raccoons is actually in Hamburg, Germany. Somebody introduced them. I don't know why they did it, but they did and they've just taken over. Raccoons love to live in our chimneys and in our back houses or storage areas, but they are a true native. Uh, they're very common. They can be very large. One year, uh, Marion and I, when I was first teaching, we raised a couple of baby raccoons in the uh, classroom. They were adorable until they got to be this big, then not so much. Fortunately, you can release them in the wild, and I think they did all right. I would not suggest you make them pets. However, uh, we were doing a rescue thing because they've been orphaned. Uh, leave them in the wild. They are omnivores, not true. They are carnivores, but they will eat plants. They'll eat garbage, as you know. And I think our new garbage bins are doing a pretty good job of keeping them at bay. Red fox, when I first came to Riverwood in 2003, we could see red fox pretty much once or twice a week. We saw their dens. They were really common. They were denning all over the city. And then about uh, six, seven years later, the coyotes began arriving. And except for one period of time when the coyote numbers drop considerably, we see very few red foxes on the property. They like to be away from coyotes because they're kind of eternal enemies. This was taken where the chapel gardens now stand uh, during that period of time. Red foxes are um, very adaptable. They get along very well with people. And every now and again, they do um, rabies drops. Uh, they drop vaccines from planes or whatever, or helicopters, or they toss them out. And you may find them on your lawn in little bags. These are designed to inoculate both the red fox and the raccoons against rabies. If your dog eats them, it will not hurt them. It's not a serious problem. And we do not have a serious problem with rabies at all. Even so, if you do get bit, you should probably go see a doctor. Um, red fox have a funny habit. When they have youngsters, they become quite tame. And I've noticed this many times that the female fox, the vixen, will actually bring her babies out and let them play in front of my camera, very close to me, and she'll nurse them. And this is usually in April or May. And then after that, it's like a switch has been turned and you can't get close to them. And you heard about the red foxes down on uh, the beaches area and they, they set up a camera and the foxes would come out. That isn't that unusual. Um, I've seen it in Algonquin Park. I've seen it in Mississauga, in Etobicoke and other places. But once they become wild again, they're gone. And the only thing I can think of is mama is showing these little babies to people and saying, you know, guys, these are what humans, you live with them. You got to learn to avoid them. And then suddenly they learn to avoid them. They also, about July or August, mom and dad start to put pressure on the fox kits to disperse. And these kits will travel up to 150 kilometers from where they were born. And most of them, honestly, do not survive. There's coyotes, there's cars, there's all sorts of accidents waiting for them. 
Um, but I do hope that we will see Fox again at Riverwood, like the good old days. This is one of my favorite encounters with Fox. It was just as you're driving out of Riverwood, I was leaving, had my camera with me, and there was a standoff between two red fox and two Canada geese. The male Canada geese is the larger of the two, and the fox is staring at it. Well, then, having been spotted, the fox did what the fox does. He lies down, he rolls around, and this is something that foxes do. It's called trolling, and they pretend to lose all interest, and ducks will actually swim closer to the shore to see what the fox is doing. This Canada goose lost all interest in the fox, turned his back, and then, bang, the fox went after it. Fox grabbed the goose by the tail. Bad mistake. The goose turned on the fox and whipped him good, helped along by his mate. And that is the story of some of the little folk at Riverwood and Mississauga. Terrific. Thank you, Dave. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, kind of a gory note to end it with. I'm just glad there wasn't a, a, a well, photo. Not, not fine. And, and I, think you, I feel like you did take photos of the uh, of the attack, but uh, thanks for not sharing there. Uh, we didn't have any disclaimers at the beginning about uh, graphic content. So, uh, That's another talk. Someday. Exactly. Another talk. Uh, but a wonderful presentation. So thank you. And uh, to everyone joining us today, again, thank you. We'll get to some questions now. Uh, or actually, first, we'll get to a comment just because uh, I wanted to show Angelo uh, just giving us a thumbs up. So thank you for that, Angelo. Thank you. Uh, going back to bats for a second, uh, a question about how hard would it be to see a bat in Riverwood? And are they scared of us? You talked about uh, you know the old fear of bats flying into people's hair or head. Uh, but uh, is that because they have no fear of us? Um, bats generally avoid us. It's really easy. Well, it was really easy when there were more bats around to see them. If you go out in the evening, you should start to see them flying around. And they that should be true in your own neighborhood. Um, but because of the decline in bat numbers, it is becoming rarer to see them. Um, bats are not dangerous. They won't bite you. But they can carry rabies because they're very difficult to inoculate and vaccinate. So uh, you don't want to handle them. If you do handle them, you have to handle them with care. Um, sadly, the number of bats are declining. And we have bat boxes. You may see a couple of them. Uh, if you know where the owl sculpture is, there's a bat box just across from it that we put up years ago. I do not know if a bat has ever used it. Uh, we still see the, the bats. They're still around, but not like they used to be. I wish that was not true. And, uh, you know, kind of along the same uh, point here in terms of uh, bat or creatures that aren't as prevalent now at Riverwood, uh, a question from Shane, which little creatures have disappeared from Riverwood over the last couple of decades? Well, groundhogs have disappeared, uh, and they could come back. Uh, we don't know. The flying squirrel used to be here. It has disappeared. Um, and that's because it needs contiguous cover. So if the trees were to cover the river, we could probably bring these guys back to Riverwood. And, but until that happens, it's not going to happen. There are flying squirrels all around us. They're up in the escarpment. They're still in the valley, but they just can't survive at Riverwood because they they don't fly, they glide, and they have to glide down. And the river becomes a major barrier. And if they land on the ground, they have to find a tree to climb up. And sometimes mink or owls or fox or raccoon or whatever are able to catch them. So flying squirrels gone. Porcupines have gone. Porcupines used to be here. I encountered a porcupine further up the valley uh, quite a few years ago. Otters. I believe I saw an otter back in the 80s, uh, but there hasn't been an otter in the whole Credit River Valley corridor for a long time now. And that's really puzzling because they are in both the rivers on either side of us. So why they're not in the Credit, I don't know. That I think that would be really exciting if Credit Valley Conservation were to report that they've seen otters back in the river, I think that would be really, really exciting for everybody. Uh, 
Uh, so turning our attention to the critters that are around, uh, a couple of people quest, uh, asked the question, what's the best time to spot uh, some of these critters? And uh, another question along the same lines, specifically for beavers, is there a better time to, uh, to spot them? Beavers are kind of crepsular. They are active around dawn and dusk. So if you go to an area where the beavers are active and you can see where they've cut trees down and it's fresh cut and you can find the ponds, this just hang out. So right now, well, last night I got to the spot at seven o'clock. I saw a beaver almost immediately and then I didn't see it. And then I saw it. And then for an hour or so we played tag at eight o'clock. Once the sun had gone below the horizon, suddenly I had four beavers out swimming around. And I think that is generally true wherever you find them. Any place that has a pond, particularly along the lake shore, um, you're likely to encounter beaver. Um, they're just they're just a lot of them here. A lot being like probably a hundred in all of Mississauga. Wow. And, really and, and in terms of uh, other of the small creatures, is it just kind of a matter of like just being out and you happen to come across them, or are there certain times of day where you might be a little bit more likely to see some of the smaller residents of Riverwood? Skunks are crepsular, so dawn and dusk, and they could be anywhere in your backyard. Same with pos opossums, they're everywhere. Again, morning and evenings. Uh, squirrels, any time of day. If you want to see squirrels, just come to Riverwood. Once we start feeding the birds again, squirrels are really common of both of all three species. Uh, groundhog are hard to find. Uh, red fox, uh, probably going to be very difficult to find unless they're in your neighborhood. Uh, coyotes, February is the best time to look for them. Uh, but again, dawn and dusk, if you're walking a dog, uh, you might have a good chance, although they're not really a small critter. Bats in the evening, obviously, or first thing in the morning. Um, mice, hard to see. If you want to see mice, uh, it's really tough. I would say the uh, hardest animal to see. But you'll see them any time of the day. If you're standing in the uh, McEwen Gardens, there's lots of meadow voles, and you'll see them dart across the trail uh, while you're watching the hummingbirds or the insects or the flowers. But um, no guaranteed place to see them. And shrews, they're strong everywhere, but they're hard. Uh, yeah. And I, and I get the feeling that maybe mice aren't high up on the list of people's, uh, you know, wanting to spot. Um, yeah. List, but uh, you know, I could be wrong. Maybe people, people are just really jonesing to see some uh, mice and, and rats at Riverwood. You'll get letters. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a last question before we wrap up, and it kind of segues nicely into a little promo here. Uh, a question from Angela: Do you do photography shoots with the public? Well, we don't at the moment have any public uh, events. Period. Uh, as a result of COVID, and we're hoping to get uh, more people back on the property uh, for events as uh, regulations allow. Uh, for the timing, though, in-person events, uh, volunteer events in person uh, remain on hold uh, for the Riverwood Conservancy. However, uh, speaking of photography, we do have uh, one more photography webinar coming up tomorrow with Dave, uh, talking about uh, working up your images uh, with some digital tools to create the best shots possible. And we will have more photography presentations, virtual presentations uh, coming up in the fall. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, unfortunately, Angela, nothing in person for the time being, uh, but we hope to uh, keep you entertained and informed with some photography presentations online for the next little while. Uh, so keep an eye on our website uh, for more information about what we have coming up tomorrow and what we have coming up a little bit later on for the fall. Uh, our website again, theriverwoodconservancy.org. Go ahead, Dave. I just add one thing. Angela, sure. you never thought about doing uh, a photography shoot uh, as part of our discovery program, but I will put that on the list. Stephanie Keeler is taking over that role uh, from me and uh, I would be happy to consider doing one. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to offer another photography course with people actually in the classroom. Uh, but that'll have to happen after COVID is, is done. Uh, but a good suggestion. I hadn't thought of it, and I, I like the idea. 
I appreciate it. And uh, again, appreciate all of you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, once more, if you do have the chance to make a donation to keep presentations like this going for us, of course, we very much appreciate your support. You can give at theriverwoodconservancy.org. And while you're there, have a look at our events page for the upcoming virtual presentations that we have scheduled. Uh, so Dave, thank you once again. Final word to you. I just want to thank everybody. It's been a lot of fun doing these presentations. I appreciate you watching. And, uh, you know, look me up on Facebook or Riverwood. Uh, we're, we've got some new programs coming up. I'm excited about that. And I always enjoy working with Rasheed. And um, it's just been fun doing this. We'll talk to you later. <laughs> Stop. But thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks again uh, to everyone for watching today. We'll have uh, more on Facebook Live and more digital events soon. And we hope to talk to you then. In the meantime, stay safe. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks for coming.